I'm going to show you how to get into transmitting your own messages on GhostNet for less than $150 worth of gear. Many of you are following the exploits of S2 Underground, whose GhostNet concept offers a practical solution for when conventional communication networks fail. It's a decentralized system that leverages amateur radio equipment to keep prepared citizens informed and connected. Currently, you rely on internet access and cell service for that. But with a little investment and a lot of practice, you can access critical information and communicate securely without reliance on traditional infrastructure. It's about maintaining control and staying linked no matter the circumstances. Welcome to Civil Defense Engineering, where we're engineering solutions for prepared citizens. So I have a confession to make. Ham radio is not my hobby. Hobbies are supposed to be something you actually enjoy, something that relaxes you. It's not supposed to be something that makes you hopping mad to the point where you're practically foaming at the mouth. You know, I hook everything up, follow all the instructions the way it's supposed to be, get all the settings right, only for it to laugh in my face like it's taunting me. But last year I was so inspired by S2 Underground's ghost net that I went out and studied for the amateur uh, radio general class exam, uh, got licensed, and purchased a thousand dollars or more worth of radio equipment using a bit of my inheritance money from grandpa, thank you grandpa, who I thought um, would have been proud of me for all of this endeavor since he used to tinker around with radios when he was younger. But if he's been looking down on me throughout this process, I'm sorry, Grandpa, I don't normally swear like a sailor, but this gersh gur gur radio won't talk to the bleep blimey computer. I didn't actually swear just now. So if even a trained engineer can't figure this stuff out and can feel defeated at times, what hope does everybody else have as well? I do think we are a long way off from just plug and play hardware that is inexpensive and accessible, but we are trying. Or maybe I'm just the biggest dolt on the planet, I won't rule that out, um, but hopefully I can explain the progression clearly enough so that uh, I can have absorbed as much of the blood, sweat, and tears as possible on your behalf. Uh, but I do kind of doubt it, because <laughs> if 10,000 of you watch this video, I only recommend at most a thousand of you seriously consider this, and probably only a hundred of you will follow up, and only 10 or so will persist to the bitter end, and probably only one of you will have it work flawlessly on the first try. Lucky guy. Or gal. Oh, who am I kidding? You're all guys. So in my first video about the ghost net, I bemoaned a lack of a baby step between an SDR receive only mode and an entry level transceiver. Oh, let me show you what I'm talking about. I've got goodies in the bag. I bemoaned the lack of a baby step between a $40 SDR that is a receive only mode and an entry level transceiver like this FT891 I have in the man pack that I'm not gonna take out for the camera because it's packed in here good. But lately I think we've found an almost solution. And I say almost because nothing is perfect in radio. Everything is a headache. But at least in terms of price, this is definitely an entry level solution. I present to you the True SDX, which is a QRP HF radio. You can do HF on it all the way up to 160 meters. It only does five watts. Actually, it does 10 watts if you've got batteries to power it with rather than just the USB. You can do up to 10 watts and 
The audio quality is terrible, but we're using digital modes on it. It doesn't matter that it's only 10 watts because ideally you want to use as little transmit power as possible. And with digital modes, you don't need that much transmit power. It's very efficient um, in that regard. So I don't understand people that are blasting out 150 or like 1500 watts on FT8. <laughs> I guess they're trying to make contacts all over the world, but with the efficient antenna, you don't even need all those watts. You're just kind of being annoying. Sorry. <laughs> but this guy only costs, I think, less than 150 bucks. It might even be cheaper than that. It's not mass produced. As you can see, it's kind of 3D printed here, this case. So you know we've arrived when they're injection molding these things. Uh, and mass producing them. So few people are currently buying them. They're niche, niche enough that they're still kind of prototypey. So things that you'll need are the radio and try to opt for the, the battery uh, attachments here. It uses three 18650 batteries um, to get you up to 10 watts. And then you'll need a audio device to connect to your computer. Um, so like this digi rig right here. Ideally, this would plug right into your computer with the USB and bypass any need for external hardware altogether. However, this version doesn't work in that way yet. I tried to follow a video that updates the firmware and all that so that you can connect directly with the USB, but either I'm not, technically apt enough or it's not ready for that yet. But they are working on that, which is going to be an important step in this ideal world of mine where we have a plug and play cheap solution for the average man or woman, but realistically man. So you will need an antenna. And I have a couple of different options here. This one, my buddy made. This is actually a chalk line. You know those chalk lines where you pull it, stick it on one end of your board and then the other and you snap it and it leaves a line for you to cut? He took out the chalk and the line and put a copper wire inside of it. Now the cool thing about this is that, um, well it winds up obviously, so it's field expedient. Nothing is perfectly field expedient. So you can make the antenna as long as you need for the whatever band you're using. And he measured out uh, exactly where the antenna would be resident on 20 meters, 40 meters, and 80 meters. Actually, no, I think it was 10 meters, 20 meters, and 40 meters. Yeah, so, and at each of those uh, lengths, he tied a knot in the wire so that you could even do this in the dark. In fact, I did do this in the dark the first time I tried it. Um, you, you put the end on one end, and then as you're feeding it out, you feel for those knots. There's one that's 10 meters, there's another one that's 20 meters, and then quite a bit later, boop, there's your 40 meters. And that's where you hook this in place, and then you've got your uh, resonant 40 meter end fed half wave antenna. So that's one option for your antenna. Then there's this, uh, Sanjian Ant 60 portable shortwave reel antenna. I haven't actually tried this one yet, but this one is a pre-made thing. Um, and it works in a similar fashion where it reels out and then um, retracts back in. You can also make your own using one of these, uh, what are they called? Banana plug? things, you can make it your own uh, dipole. So it's got a coax BNC connector on one end, and then these banana plugs on each end, and then measure out your resonant length of wire to go each way. Dipoles are the gold standard of the most efficient antennas, uh, as long as you measure the correct lengths. And, uh, but they're not as easy to deploy uh, because you have to have this part in the middle and lastly, you do need a, a bit of coax to connect from your radio to your antenna. 
So that's basically all you really need to get started. And now I will explain the setup and show a little bit of ghost netting in action. Oh, and links uh, for all the hardware here will be in the description for your convenience because I'm trying to make life easy on you. I'm trying. I'm trying. It wasn't easy on me. I spent so many hours just like tearing my hair out and I'm going bald. Ah! So let's talk about the setup. There are three things we need to go over. There is the hardware and the connections between all the devices. Then there's the radio settings inside the radio itself and then the software settings inside of JS8 call. So hardware and connections. Uh, the antenna is an NFED half-wave antenna, strung up in kind of a sloper NVES configuration, which is rather close to the ground. I think the highest point is around eight feet, and then it slopes down to about two feet. Just above where the coax connects, there is an audio and a serial connection that goes into the digirig, which is our audio interface to the computer. Both the digirig and the radio have a USB connection that needs to go into the computer. And then the computer itself needs to be loaded with JS8 call. And you need various drivers for the digirig, etc., which should install automatically. Radio settings. There aren't a lot of settings on the true SDX that you need to worry about. The menu is very simple because it's a very simple radio. I think there are, there's like three different menus. The second one is for CW, the third one, I forgot what it's for, but these I think are the relevant settings you'll have to change. So the first one is the volume. This one you might have to dial in a little bit. I think I set mine at around 10. You don't want it to be too loud or too quiet because you want to kind of have it in that sweet spot Goldilocks zone for the JS8 call software to be able to decode it. For mode, you want it to be on upper sideband. This is not USB as in the computer plug. It's upper sideband, which usually on 40 meters voice, you're using lower sideband. But for digital modes, it's at least for JS8 call, it uses upper sideband. And then you watch the widest bandwidth you can I think 4,000 kilohertz is what this uses. The band for JS8 call, for GhostNet at least, is 40 meters. Tuning steps, you can have it at 1K if you want, whatever is convenient. And then the other settings, I'm not sure how important they are, but there they are for reference. Software settings, I've tried a lot, a lot of things, and here's what I think works the best, most consistently. So let me explain what's going on here. So first is the radio tab. And I used to try and, when I was using my FT891, select that as the rig and try using cat control. And I was having troubles with it. Cat control means computer actuated transceiver or something like that, computer aided transceiver. Basically what it allows you to do is let the program change the frequencies, etc., whatever settings necessary in your transceiver through the connection. I have had lots of trouble with this. So in the end, what I've opted to do is for rig, I'll say none. And the push to talk method is RTS, which is request to send. Then you'll find what port is being used. In this case, it was COM12. You can check this by opening up your device manager and searching for the serial or COM port then unplug your device and whichever one disappears or reappears when you plug it back in, that's that's what you want to use. And that's the radio, not the digirig. Then going over to the audio tab, this is how the audio actually gets into the program, and that's the digirig. And then you can use the device manager again and see which one is the digirig, but it'll probably be pretty obvious. It'll show up as USB, etc., USB audio device. And then when you're ready, hit test PTT. And one issue I was seeing happen is sometimes the red light for transmit, or in the case of the true SDX, there's a little T that appears to indicate that you are transmitting. And it will just constantly be on. I don't know why. So I just unplug everything, try it again, and maybe it'll work. I find the settings in JSA call to and probably other digital modes, just to be very finicky. And 
It drives me crazy. And to wrap up, here are some other GhostNet monitoring options. You can use WebSDR. S2 Underground has a fantastic video on how to get started with all that. And this is a great way to practice. You don't even need any hardware. You can do everything on your computer. And then you can take the next step and buy your own SDR dongle for monitoring with whatever you can receive yourself. And that's that's pretty fun once you've figured that out because you can actually, you can realize, oh wow, I'm actually receiving signals from the other side of the country and, and it's pretty exciting. And then right now, what we're talking about is the next level, which is being able to transmit your own messages. And pretty soon, I know S2 is working on this, we're going to be talking about how to use a Mesh-tastic to integrate into the whole network. I don't know how to do this yet. There is a good video by the comms channel, but I haven't tried it myself yet. And here's what I'm talking about with the Mesh-tastic. Uh, these are not ham radios. They are um, kind of DIY little radios that use 900 megahertz, I believe. It's roughly equivalent to what a cell phone would use. I think it's a little bit of a longer wavelength. So it has similar uh, propagation to a cell phone, um, but there's not cell towers that it connects to. It's just how many nodes do you have? And they, they talk to each other um, and they can relay between each other. So this is a kind of a cool new technology for the average citizen don't even need ham license or anything. Um, and so S2 Underground is working on a way to connect to the ghost net through JS8 call using this type of radio. Um, and you can query whether there are messages for, um, for the ghost net. And uh, anybody who is hooked into the HF net will be able to forward those messages to you. So that's gonna be a really, really cool addition once it's, once it's working. And lastly, we conclude every video with some action items. So if this is not for you, you should probably designate a comms guy on your group. So identify somebody who has a little bit of technical aptitude or interest in radios or communication equipment and have him dive into this in more detail. And then you need to develop a PACE plan for communications. You should have PACE and contingency plans for all kinds of things, but especially comms. Because if your group can't link up, you can't communicate, you don't have a group. You don't want to be completely reliant on the internet. I suspect that they're planning a massive cyber attack. I don't know, it's just a hunch. They keep talking about it. And lastly, consider getting ham licensed. You would probably definitely want to do that if you're going to be practicing in non-emergency times. Uh, you are allowed to use amateur radio in emergency times without a license. I mean, FCC hasn't typically gone after people unless they're causing lots of harmful interference. However, the other ham radio operators, especially the legacy old guys, they will jump down your throat. <laughs> so get licensed just for that sake alone. How do I conclude my video, Lulu? <laughs> That's it for today's video. Consider subscribing if you're interested in all of this engineering stuff for prepared citizens. I've only put out a video every two weeks or so. So if this is interesting enough to you, just hit the bell notification and you'll be notified of the next video. So see you next time.